process here. These are two of our artists. Those of you who have been coming to first stage for years will know these folks. Uh, Frank Britton and Justin Weeks um, have, are two of my favorite actors. Uh, Frank, uh, you've seen in, I'm gonna try to get them all, Frank. So Floyd Collins, When the Rain Stops Falling and won the Helen Hayes Award uh, for Jesus Hop the Eight Train and, and then Farnsworth, I think was the latest show or maybe, I can't remember which came first, Farnsworth or Jesus Hop the Eight Train, but you've seen Frank many times on first stage. <laughs> And then of course you've seen Justin Weeks in Lobby Hero, which was really a turning point for, for me and the company in certain ways. Um, the Wall Street Journal came to that show and called it um, the best regional production in the country that year. Um, and Justin uh, was such a major part of that and has become uh, has been in the first stage family ever since. So we're so grateful to Frank and Justin to being here today. Um, I'm gonna to talk as little as possible so I can turn it over to them. What they're going to do is just share a little piece of what they're working on, um, just to give you a taste of what's being built. The, uh, the goal, of course, is in another six months or so for these pieces to really start taking shape and be full pieces, but they're not there yet. They're, they're, they're in the beginning of process. So this is a look into the process. Um, these pieces are meant to be done on stage, not over Zoom, but they'll work for what we need today. Um, and then at the end of this, my, my partner in crime, Deirdre Starnes, our Associate Artistic Director and I, uh, we'll lead a little uh, conversation and discussion with Frank and Justin about the process of, of building their work. Um, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Frank Britton. Frank? Thank you, Alex. Hi, everyone. Um, this piece, uh, it's called At the Corner Where Love Lives. Um, it's shaping up to be a very nonlinear piece. Uh, so I'm going to start at uh, where I am in the beginning, and then I'm going to seriously jump um, because I realized I had written a lot and it timed out to be quite long. Um, so I'm going to um, let you guys know when, when I jump and um, I'm going to keep forward uh, towards um, where I'm going to end, uh, where, where I've ended in the draft. So uh, here we go. <laughs> At the corner where love lives, lights down, I enter in the black, sits in the chair, which is option, and lights up. I just wanted to communicate with people. That's always been my response to the question asked of me of why I became an actor, of what inspired me to pursue this craft. I've been doing this professionally for nearly 20 years, and I still approach it all with a sense of curiosity and a sense of wonder. As time passed through the years, I realized there was another reason for my being in this business and becoming a lifelong practitioner of this craft. I didn't want to be alone. I wanted a sense of, a feeling of community. I never thought I'd be an actor. I'm a regular cat, a native Washingtonian who spent his formative years in both DC and Maryland and someone who thinks of himself as someone of no real importance. In middle school and high school, I was very social, popular even, especially in high school. I was voted friendliest senior male in the senior superlatives announcement, and it was forever documented in our yearbook. I had community. I had a community. But I always felt like an extremely solitary person. Even though I discovered that I was an ambivert early on, I could adapt to different environments. So. Why do we need each other? Why do we need community? Even if many of us don't feel like we do, it comes down to basic human need. In the craft of acting, there is something called the super objective for the character or role you're playing. What does your character want? How does he, she, or they go about getting what they want? What do they need in that moment? and for the rest of their lives. The super objectives can be different, but underneath it all for me is love. That is what each of us look for or don't actively look for. What each of us wants, what each of us needs. Love is that tie. Love is that hook that connects us in some way. May 27th, 2014 took me to an entirely new place with that. And it wasn't the craft, it was an event in my own personal life. 
May 26, 2014, was just like any other day for me as a thankful and grateful working actor. It was opening night of a play that had changed my life and the trajectory of my career. Stephen Atlee Gurgis's The Last Days of Jesus Iscariot. The play had already been in my life for about six years at that time. I appeared in the DC premiere of it, then in a remount of it six months later. Half of the original DC premiere cast returned with new cast family. I can even conversed with Stephen himself earlier that day, expressing my excitement. I was so jazzed up for this as all of us were. Opening night went very well. And then I was one of the remaining few of the cast party. I leave to make my way around the corner while checking a text from the 7-Eleven and I was making my way to a cab bay. This was before Uber and Lyft became commonplace. So I was making my way towards these cabs. This is downtown Silver Spring and it was pretty much deserted at that time of night, save for the cab drivers congregating and chatting. As I approach the cab bay in the opposite direction, moving towards me are four young men. Even being as hypervigilant as I usually am, I made nothing of it, but I was of a mind to immediately shove my phone into my duffel bag. As we passed each other, life had completely changed for me, and I was suddenly struck with the sensation as if I were slammed into a body of water, then drowning, only that it was a tight fist, maybe brass knuckles, smashing in parts of the right side of my face and my head hitting the concrete. Most of my valuables were snatched, save for the lone iPod that had somehow flown out of my duffel bag as they were pulling it from my person. As I was attempting to rise from the ground, completely dazed, I felt a hand move towards my neck to yank a necklace, which held a silver unk that belonged to my great grandmother, which I'd worn for over 15 years. That was the last thing they robbed me of, or so I thought. I wasn't unconscious. I sprang to my feet almost immediately after they took off into the night. I always knew that I was a physically tough individual, but the damage was far more serious than I initially surmised. A hemorrhaged right eye, orbital bone fracture, right cheekbone completely shattered, and a massive head contusion. My skull is pretty thick. I found out because of uh, an accident I suffered in tech 11 years before. Doctor told me I had a pretty thick skull. I'm still trying to wrap my head around that to this day, whether that's a good thing or not. <laughs> I knew my face was partially broken when I touched it and bones slid upward. A small pool of blood began to form where I was standing, then another as I moved in a different direction. Yeah, it was bad. Imagine your life changing like that in less than 30 seconds. Imagine coming out of your physical being and your physical surroundings in a few micro nanoseconds. And through all of this, up to this moment, all I could think about was the show I just opened. The first thing I said once the cab drivers gathered around and watched me, the first thing I thought was, how am I going to finish my show? <laughs> See. That's how much of a singular ultra-focused mind I have when, when it comes to my work. I wasn't even thinking about anything else, not even the fact that my possessions were jacked from my person or that I was nearly bleeding to death and disfigured on the downtown Silver Spring Street. I was only concerned about whether I'd be well enough to return to work. Once I reached the hospital, I managed to reach two of my closest friends before the morphine took effect and I awakened in an entirely new and singular hospital room. A group of good friends became a small team of my caregivers while I was hospitalized and for a time thereafter. This all happened within a few hours. A few of them even stayed overnight with me. Team Chai Latte, they named themselves. Chai Latte is a nickname for me that began years ago in a play rehearsal and it stuck. There was a waiting room adjacent to mine and it stayed packed with visitors from what I was told. My Sister arrived with the demeanor of someone who was ready to go out to those responsible. I was then surprised to see my own father, whom I hadn't seen in 12 years at that time. He arrived with a copy of the Washington Post Express rolled up in his hand with the attack already having made the morning edition with a four-year-old photo of me in it. His visit was brief, 
I didn't know how to handle the moment and I don't know if he knew either. Later, a detective arrived, information was exchanged, the most pertinent of which is that I disclosed that I had the packaging information to the iPad that was stolen from me. And with that, they were able to track down one of the assailants. Me and the events of May 27 stayed in the news cycle on and off for over a year and a half. But this outpouring of love, it was overwhelming in the most positive and beautiful way. And at the same time, for someone who considers himself to be unassuming and of the background, I was wondering at times, what did I do to deserve all the support, all this love? I give love as much as I humanly and possibly can, and that's what I love to do. I believe that to love is part of my life's purpose, and I know that I am not the only one with that belief about themselves. Not to get esoteric nor cliche about it, but I firmly believe that. The question was answered for me in that moment, but deep down, I know that that question will remain with me for the remainder of my life, and I think that may be a good thing. This is not to say that I didn't receive love from my family. I most absolutely did, but this was another love I never would have expected and was almost unprepared for. That love was different and I welcomed it wholeheartedly. I was surrounded by angels, my community, family, and the community I didn't know personally, all angels. I was beyond any discernible humanly level of gratitude if I never felt truly fortunate before, I knew that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Uh, wow, 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 wow. Uh, I, I miss uh, I miss that moment of applause that we, uh, we, we that ritual that we've grown used to. I think it's one of the things I, I miss most. But Frank, please know and see that we are all with you. Feel free, as some of you already are, to, to send some love towards just Frank in the chat. Um, Thank you all. Thank you. Frank. <laughs> um, we'll check back in with Frank and talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but I want to turn it over to my friend Justin Weeks to share his piece with us. Justin. Hi, <laughs> my name is Justin Weeks. Before we begin, just because I'm not there with you all, and I wish we could be there together uh, as humans in one room, um, I wanna try something real quick. Please stay with me through this technology Zoom medium. Um, everyone could allow your eyes to drift close and find both of your feet on the ground and to feel the soles of your feet on the ground and the three points of your feet. And breathe in. And breathe out. And allow your eyes to drift open. I just wanted to share that moment of breath. Uh, I wanna begin by thanking Alex Levy and Deidre Starnes and the rest of the First Stage family. Um, this has been a great joy, one of the great joys um, of my artistic uh, evolution. Uh, so thank you. Um, this piece is still growing, uh, obviously, and still becoming. Um, it's called A Fine Madness or For the Record. Um, at least that's what it's called for the time being. Um, I've learned over the course of the greater uh, last year that um, playwriting uh, not only is a process of investigating, but also a process of getting out of the way and allowing the piece to reveal itself uh, to me. So I want to share three quotes. Um, you could call them scriptures that I've been uh, living by um, when it comes to writing this piece. Um, the first, he looked at his own soul with a telescope. What seemed all irregular, he saw 
and showed to be beautiful constellations. And he added to the consciousness hidden worlds within worlds. Samuel Coldridge. You want to sleep on my chest? You want to hear my heart beat all through the night? It's the only jazz station with a 24-hour signal, if you want to listen. Essex Hemphill. But the price is a long look backward when we came in an unflinching assessment of the record. James Baldwin. Um... This past year and a half, um, we have, whether we wanted to or not, liked it or not, have found ourselves face-to-face, uh, -face, up close and personal, and developing a relationship um, with virus. And more, uh, and I would say more so than virus, I think with our own uncertainties, I think both uh, nationally and globally. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, this May marks five years that I'll have been not only living with, but thriving with, um, the human immune deficiency virus, otherwise known, otherwise known as HIV. Now, um, what I feel like I've been going through in the past five years, over the past year, the country has been kind of getting a taste of, right? Um, in a lot of ways, I feel kind of, I, I've, or I felt kind of jealous of COVID-19, how open, um, and how unstigmatized this virus has been. Meanwhile, we've been living through a pandemic over the past 40 years, um, that has not been met with, uh, such open arms that's often been kept, um, in the dark, in the shadows, in the quiet, um, this piece serves to um, help re um, destigmatize virus, people living with virus, how we think about virus, how we think about disease, which truly, from a different angle, we can talk we, we, we can talk about what it means to live. You know, um, which I think we're all kind of grappling with uh, at this moment. Um, this piece, I'm really inspired by um, radio, radio documentary form, um, which is uh, the creative treatment of actuality, right? So um, this is an amalgamation of stories, of interviews, of um, uh, film. Uh, I'm creating a short film film with this project um i'm playing with uh kind of F the acoustic film style my idea is that the audience the spectators of this piece would be wearing headphones and um a lot of uh a lot of the piece would be um the experience of you hearing it uh, i want to leave mental fossils um i want to leave you all with mental fossils um, in this play, uh, and the way we hear, um, is a big part of that. Um, so I'd like to share a bit of the piece. Like I said, it's still in development. Um, so at the beginning, I'll read opening stage directions, and then, um, I'll head into it. Uh, this is a working portion of A Fine Madness or For the Record. <clears throat> Darkness and a light bulb and a microphone. From the deep darkness of the stage, a man emerges there is a magical light bulb moment. Perhaps the light is related to the proximity of the man. He 
is what makes the light go on, his presence. A cacophony of sounds concentrated into the light bulb. The medium is the message. The man approaches the microphone. The sound is transmitted directly into the ears of the spectator. He speaks. For the record, I do not know if this will be used or how this will be used to get to where it's going. Uh, I summon these thoughts as one draws breath enough to relieve themselves. Uh, this is a stopping for air, or uh, uh, coming up for air, rather. A potentially chaotic organization of thoughts, ideas, musings, questions, and fears. My fine madness. They need five tubes. You know, uh, it is said that the true story of a person is written in their blood. I've always found that odd. Uh, not the sentiment, but the articulation of it. The syntax written in their blood. Not found, but written as if something is etched in my veins and not flowing through it. Cuts. Like, to write something means to will it into existence, that it's there by design, right? The idea that there is something flowing through me that is against my will, something that cannot be extracted no matter how deeply excavated. I was floored when I heard um, the idea of epigenetics explained to me, that, you know, we inherit our parents' DNA, right? But our DNA is made up of, ex it's made up of experiences, essentially. Everything we experience rewires us down to a cellular level. So by our experience, we are changed forever, and then we give those experiences down to our children. It's why our offspring uh, not only resemble us physically, but like somehow take on attributes. Like here's this brand new human being doing things with his hands that his father does instinctively. Like how could he possibly know what he's doing? We inherit bone structure, we inherit some brain function, and it seems we inherit hurt. Transformation, alchemy, transmutation, divination. <laughs> Am I scaring you? The Voyager record, um, I think about it a lot. In 1977, uh, NASA sent up into space a time capsule of humanity, if you will. A record, a vinyl record that if played will provide extraterrestrial life with music, images, and messages about life here on Earth. An enormous scientific advancement, and we were the first to do it. America, well, we stay winning, don't we? Mm -hmm. Always first, always on top. Our announcement into the stars of who we are. Not once on that record is there a mention of war, of poverty, of religion, of nationalism, of ideology, of disease, of virus. If life out there in the ethers of the cosmos were to decode that record which we call golden, there is no record that I or a person like me exists. I am not represented in our golden record of humanity. A constellation made from the spots on my body. A starry, starry night. And a garden grew from his face. And we knew we were beautiful and ugly, too. This is an amendment, a reclamation, an assessment, an experiment. A setting the record straight. And in scene.
Uh, hey y'all. Um, thank you. <laughs> I don't know how much, uh, I mean, I saw that there were some volume problems and people were not uh, able to hear maybe everything. Um, but yeah, that's my piece. So far, it's, it's a lot about science, the stories science tells itself. It works to be a affirmational tool. Um, all of the stories that we have in the American theater canon that are, um, that discuss and deal with HIV, um, it's all white. They're all white. And um, I cannot place myself or my experience in things that I've seen or, or read in the canon. Um, the most recent work uh, <laughs> to be included into the canon is a play called by uh, Danye Love uh, called One in Two. Um, I would like for you to know that um, that is the statistic of, of Black men who identify as gay or bisexual who will contract HIV in their lifetime, one in two. It is half of us. Um, music is a celebration of music. It's a celebration of body, of voice, of tongue, of blood. Um, uh, Stevie Wonder's Songs in the Key of Life and John Coltrane's Ascension, those two albums have been uh, landmarks for me um, as I have devised this piece. Um, um, before we turn things over uh, to, the, to, to you all for the questions, I just wanna leave you all with a quote. Um, another James Baldwin quote. Uh, he has also become not just, you know, my writing inspiration, writing muse, he always has been, but for this piece in particular, he's someone that I keep coming back to as a touchstone. Um, this is from one of his essays called A Talk to Teachers. Let's begin by saying that we are living through a very dangerous time. Everyone in this room is in one way or another aware of that. We are in a revolutionary situation, no matter how unpopular that word has become in this country. The society in which we live in is desperately menaced from within. So any citizen of this country who figures himself as responsible, and particularly those of you who deal with the hearts and minds of young people, must be prepared to go for broke. This is my going for broke. Um, thank you. I'm going to pass it over um, to you all. Wow. Thank you, thank you, Justin. Amazing, amazing. I, I have to have to tell you all that that these first look um, uh, series are really are really emotional for me because uh, we've been we've been holding close these eleven artists who who are creating such incredible work and and these first times of sharing some of their words in front of folks. Um, reminds me of the power of, of storytelling. Reminds me of why this investment was so necessary. Um, and and um, just just makes me miss you all that much more. I, I will tell you as an artistic director, um, I have two, uh, several blessings, but two great blessings that are that are apparent in, in this program. Number one, through all of this hard time of being apart for folks, we, uh, we count amongst our first stage family the, and I truly mean this, the most talented um, whole human artists uh, that, that any artistic director could ever dream of. The 11 folks who are, who are making this work and all the folks who are supporting them um, are incredible artists, incredible voices, and incredible people. And as an artistic director, during what's been a hard year, um, that's been a lot to hang on to. I also uh, would be sort of failing if I didn't point out that when we made this decision to create this program, um, as, as I've done before, it was a leap uh, and, and the hope that somebody would catch us. Uh, we really didn't know how long we'd be out of um, 
how long would be closed. Um, at the time, the feeling was that many theaters would not make it back through the uh, the pandemic. Um, most folks, lots of folks, were saying to to shut her up, and we decided to to make this commitment. And we made this commitment without. Uh, not we didn't write a grant and then wait for it and then make the commitment. We said we made the commitment and then said we'd go figure out how how we were going to do it. Um, and we started making some phone calls to people, just telling them what we wanted to do. Um, and many of you uh, wrote checks to make this possible. And many of you are here with us today. Um, and I just want to acknowledge some of the folks who are in the room who helped make this possible: Barry Sullivan and Alan Scott, Stephanie Katz. Boots, Bootsy and Humo Humanensky, uh, Holly Hassett and Kathy Mara all were amongst the first folks in those early days where we had no idea what was ahead um, who said, yes, uh, let, me, let me help you do this. So thank you all for being here. Um, I want to uh, uh, call to the stage, so to speak, <laughs> uh, my partner here, Deirdre Starnes, um, who uh, will join me in leading a, a, a conversation uh, with Frank and Justin. Um, Deirdre and I will ask a couple questions, but um, as I think Aria has said, please um, go ahead and let her know if you have questions, because we, we would like to, to make sure that we include you all in the conversation. So Deirdre, welcome. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um... It is always such a pleasure to see you and to be in front of our family. Uh, we always think of you as family and we so, so miss you. Um, I even see uh, some friends from the stage. I see Adrian and I see Alan and, and Tracy and JJ and I see Jane and Joan and our volunteers and Sandy and Eileen and if I miss anyone it's not because I don't love you it's because I don't have my glasses on I can't see um, and there are so many of you on here today over 50 people so thank you so much for your support and thank you gentlemen uh, for your gift of sharing your stories, your gift of giving your voice, your gift of just your complete, I don't even know how to say it, but transparency, I think I said that already, but just your heart, just your pouring out of your heart and sharing your stories with us. So I actually would like to uh, start with just a fun question for Frank, um, just to get the ball rolling a little bit, nothing too deep, because uh, Alex likes to do the deep stuff. Um, and I want to get my fun stuff in before we get started. So Frank, can you explain to us why Charlotte became your nickname? OK, um, <laughs> yes. Good old friend of mine, Fiona Blackshaw. This was back in 2007. I was rehearsing a production of Antigone uh, with Foreign Theism. And she had a lot, she played the chorus, I was the messenger, and we were all on stage and she was describing each one of us. In the script, in that adaptation, she said, describing me with the script, she said, that pale young man over there. And then she stopped and said, no, that's not right. She said, no, she said, that chai latte brother over there. So that's where it started. <laughs> that's my origin story, if you will. Somehow I thought it was because that was your favorite Starbucks drink. <laughs> no, I, I rarely patronize Starbucks. <laughs> I'm in pop coffee shops before Starbucks. I like the little corner ones. Those are my favorites. I'm looking forward to getting back to doing that uh, once we all can. And then I know we have a few questions in the chat. I have another fun question for Justin, only because he named two of, of, of my favorite artists. Um, how was it that of, of all the amazing artists out there uh, musically that you landed on John Coltrane and Stevie Wonder? Uh, because they are both prolific and profound musical artists, but very different in their presentation of their musical artistry? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> John Coltrane, um, I recently watched a documentary. It was taken off Netflix, but Netflix used to have a documentary about John Coltrane. And I didn't really know much about that brother. 
And I was floored, not just by, you know, his musicianship and the music, which is, you know, what, what, what we know of John Coltrane, I was so intrigued and fascinated by the mathematical approach that he took to music. And near the end of his career, his, um, if you listen to, if sonically, if you listen to the way his, he's playing his music, the way he's writing his music, it begins to, um, a lot of people say that uh, um, John Coltrane's kind of final era as a musician was, is largely misunderstood because to, um, I won't say an untrained ear, but maybe to an ear that's not well-versed in jazz, uh, it, it's like a cacophony of sound. And um, one of the first albums that I was given from my mother was the Ascension album. And I remember listening to that during the pandemic and uh, I don't know, having kind of a visceral emotional response to it and just kind of kept it around. Um, Sounds in the Key of Life is one of the best albums of all time. Uh, Varna, I mean, anything Stevie Wonder has, you know, touches. Uh, that particular album, I've grown up with that album and I've known the music. Uh, I was having, I was going through a time where I, I wasn't uh, loving the skin I was in. Uh, and I was having a hard time. I was just having a hard time in my body. Um, and like with age and with, you know, some things that the, that the virus does, you know, I, there was a point in time where I was, I had a lot of what looked like bruises on my body. Um, which have since gone away, but I was so self-conscious. And I remember turning on Shuffle, not the album and then Shuffle, just Shuffle in my music. And the song Contusion from Songs in the Key of Life started playing. And I was like, what is this? It's just instrumental. And it's called Contusion. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but Steve Wonder was in an off, he was in a, uh, a car crash uh, that uh, almost cost him his life, like back in the 70s. Um, and Contusion is his musical manifestation of the, 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 the bruising uh, on his brain that he suffered. Um, it made me feel beautiful that song uh and it's so wild and it's so free and it's so odd and peculiar and the fact that he called it contusion and i was having these this thing with bruises and spots it just made me feel beautiful and i felt kind of seen in a way by a musician in a way that i hadn't felt in a while but yeah Listen to those albums if you haven't. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, I, I do need to share that my first year in uh, learning about theater formally uh, in my movement class, uh, the teacher always played songs from Sounds in the Key of Life for us to uh, warm up to. So it is an all-time favorite of mine because it was my first professional uh, training as a teen. Um, Ariel, I think we, you said we have some questions. We do, uh, do have some questions. All right. I'm okay. sorry to interrupt you, Dee. Um, I'd like to start with Sophia Quintero. Sophia, I'm gonna ask you to unmute so you can ask your question. Do we have a Sophia? Sophia Quintero? Yes, hi, sorry. Um, I, there was music playing in the common space of my house, so oh, I, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, hi, so I kind of stumbled upon this by accident almost. Um, I'm like new to the area and I mean, I'm sure everyone can relate that it's been really difficult, um, especially in a position where I just graduated from undergrad and kind of had all of my plans uh, put on hold for the time being. So I was 
looking into places in the community and just was like, I have nothing to lose. So I'll just come and say hello to some new people. Um, yeah, so hi. Uh, I wrote down just like some uh, comments and questions for both uh, pieces and I'll just like read what I wrote down. Uh, Frank, I said, thank you for your vulnerability. I felt incredibly alone for the past year in a way I didn't believe to be possible and that I felt like the way that I feel doesn't matter. The world is so heavy in increasingly obvious ways and I'm fortunate enough to not have to worry too much about my most basic needs. I feel as though as I, I am expected to care so much about everything. There is nothing left to feel um, about how I feel about how my creative freedoms have sort of been taken away so abruptly. And the one sort of question that I had just out of curiosity is, is this piece a collection of stories or does it mostly center around uh, the story you shared today? And, uh, thank you, Sophia, for your question and comments. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, my apologies, everyone. I was a bundle of nerves today. I said I was going to jump and I didn't notify y'all. So my apologies again, but I thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, not necessarily, a, it was originally centered around the attack until mm -hmm. uh, through guidance and through mentorship, it's part of a larger picture from and uh, getting on that theme of love and universality of it to the commonality of it, how we eat differently relate to it and how we uh, sit with it and live with it and give it and receive it. Uh, so it's become more of a, a broad, it's evolving into a much more broader um, thing, but it's not, uh, at this point, based on a collection of stories, it originally was around the attack, and but uh, it's it's moving further. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so very, much. You're very well. Thank you. We have a question from Diane Carode. Diane, I'm going to ask you to unmute, please, so you can ask your question. Me? Uh, yes, please. Okay. I was. Obviously, Frank and Justin just um, publicly and in the past have talked about their vulnerabilities. And recently, I've been reading or hearing Brianne, what's her last name? Um, some of you probably know her. Um, uh, just forgot, Brianne, Brianne Brown, who talks about vulnerability and how it, by expressing it, it makes us stronger, not weaker. And I know that Justin said that we should go for broke. And I'm certainly feeling that way, having been born in a lower middle income area that became all black. I just don't know how to go for broke. And I know it's up to each of us to decide how to do that. And I wondered if Frank and Justin had any words they could say about that. I can write, I can post, maybe create a blog, but there are so many of those already. So, or D, if you have any ideas, speak up. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it's good to hear your voice, Diane. Uh, Same well. here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the phrase go for broke, I think depending on where you're sitting, uh, it can have a different, it looks different for everyone. But I think ultimately the sentiment of going for broke is kind of a risking what you know. Mm -hmm. um, there's a kind of surrender um, well, I think I say as humans, we love being in control, right? We need to have some say a hand in a hand or feel as though we have our hands 
on our circumstances, our choices, our lives, our situations. You know, it's, it's just part of being human, you know. But also like the, on the flip side of that, what I've learned over these past five years is that <laughs> stability, I'm not so sure it exists. I think it's an illusion. Um, you know, that, we're, that we constantly look uh, outside of ourselves for, um, for, st for stability, whether it be oh, that job, I need that job, I need this, I need that, and, and that will help me feel um, centered or like uh, I have it going on, or at least I have some control over my life and where it's going. To go for broke, especially in regards to teaching our young people um, is kind of throwing out the window all that we thought we knew in service to, in service to actually learning and teaching, you know? Um, there's so much unlearning that has to be done to kind of like move forward. It, and I think going for broke, to say, this is me and I'm going for broke is a surrendering to control um, and a surrendering to the unknown and the infinite possibilities of what can be, you know? Um, we don't have it all figured out, you know? Uh, and children will be the first to remind you <laughs> uh, as, you know, they have a, never ending arsenal of questions, you know, and oftentimes we don't know how to answer them. Uh, I think in serving our young people, we have to be willing to go for broke and admit that we don't know as much as we do and give that up to then start building upon something else. I hope that made sense. <laughs> I hope. Mm. Yes, it does. I was just trying to write in the chat that kids are so honest and we learn how not to be, but we all have vulnerabilities and fears and health issues and other matters that we keep to ourselves or we don't. And I, I haven't been willing to, you know, come out big time, but um, I struggle every day. I just, I'll admit, I don't want to get hit in the face and I don't want somebody to attack me. And I know the odds of that are far less than it is for people of color. Um, I just saw there was an article in the post, I don't know if you saw it, about how to, how to take a picture. If you see something happening about how to use your cell phone that you're supposed to hold it up high so that the police don't question you um, because if you hold your cell phone and you videotape something they think you're hiding it I don't know if I have had the guts to hold it up high and that's a tiny action but I am sure a cop is going to come over to me and say what are you doing put that cell phone away because I did tape something once in a health environment where someone elderly was being abused and someone took my cell phone away. That's just a small action. And there is this fear that I'm going to be walloped. And you live with this daily, let's face it. I don't for obvious reasons, but you know, how do you move past that so that you could have a bigger impact? I don't know, the written word, the spoken word, the blogs, the posts, I, I don't know. That's such an important question, Diane, that I think all of us are, are grappling with and trying to find the answers to. And, and we, thank, we thank you so very much for sharing uh, with us, um, you know, how you feel about this and making yourself vulnerable. I believe, Ariel, we have one or two more questions. And then, Mr. Carlos, um, 
we may try to get yours in if you all are okay with us going over a little bit because I have some exciting news that I do want to share with you and some information that I want to pass on. Ariel? Yes, thank you. Um, Eileen, you're our next question. I'm going to ask you to unmute, please. Eileen Mandel. Hi there. Um, it's for both of you, and it's a little bit more about your process than about the other questions. I'm doing a lot of writing. I took advantage of this terrible year to, to write, which because I said, if I don't use this year, I'll never do it because I've said for years, I will write. And so this, so I'm really pleased with myself, but, and to answer Diane as well, I find that my vulnerabilities are easy to share in a group of writers who are like, who like me are writing. They're, they are not like me necessarily, but they are writing like I am. And it's a safe space. And we're trying to use the particular to write universal stories. And I'm wondering if both of you have small groups and groups of people that you can trust to listen and trust to help you hear what you're, you're doing. And the other question I have is, have you asked anyone else to read your pieces for you? Because that has opened my eyes in an enormous way. So those are my questions. Hi, Ms. Eileen. Hi, um, we, we do, uh, within our cohorts, we have, uh, we check in with each other and um, we have, we've been um, put into small groups. Today was only the second time, and this is a wider audience, where my work has been heard. Um, the first time, the first person I shared any of my work with was uh, Jasmine Cardenas, who's in our cohorts, and I read, and this was when I was writing out my drafts, and I read it to her, and she was the first person I read it, I read anything I had to uh, with this play. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely, you know, within the first stage family, there's that support and uh, we can lean on each other. And for, because this is my first play, I've never written a play. Uh, I, I used to write for my high school newspaper back in the day, I was a, their film critic, but um, this is the first time sharing a piece that's so personal that um, I knew I definitely needed that guidance. And I also have friends who are well-known, established playwrights uh, that I um, uh, can check in with and ask questions. And, uh, and I, I know I have the support around me and I'm, I'm grateful, I'm grateful for that. Lord, can y'all see me? Okay, my phone fell. Um, this is the first time that people are here. Can I, I mean, yeah, this is the first. This is the first time. Um, I've been very kind of guarded about sharing <laughs> my writing. Um, I've always written. Um, my whole life, I've written. I've you know, I have journals upon journals on journals. Um, and being in this process, especially wearing this hat, this new hat. Um, as playwright, you know, uh, as writer, is it, for me, I found, you know, it's been such a way for me to process and articulate what had been left so long still in mom. I really had to find that quiet place. Um, and create from there and to make sure that what I'm saying is true and authentic to what, to what I'm feeling, what my experience is. Um, so now, you know, it's, it, it really feels like this is the closest I will ever come to, to um, being pregnant, I feel like it really feels <laughs> that way. That like, oh, you know, this thing is it's here, it's coming, it's forming, with it, and it has a life of its own, and I kind of have to get out of the way of it. Um, but yeah, now it's time that I can start like sharing the baby, and I do have, you know, we have our cohort, which is a group of amazing, amazing artists who are going through the same thing. Um, even if we aren't necessarily expressing the same thing through our work. Uh, 
and that we're all we're we're we're, we're a varied bunch you know that i can go to someone who is new like me and be like ah, do y'all not like are you having this problem that i'm having and then go to someone who you know is more seasoned in this craft and pick their brain and really be a student um what was the second now i guess that was part one i forgot part two of the question i guess the second the second thing is how and, and obviously you haven't done this, but I had somebody read something that I wrote out loud. So as an actor, and mm -hmm. it changed the way I thought about it. I liked it better actually than when mm -hmm. I read it, but I also heard things that I didn't know were there and they weren't necessarily bad. They were just, it was just an eye opener for me. So you obviously haven't done that, but it it's really an interesting process to go through not only reading your work to others but having someone else read it to you so have you done that was the question but the i know the answer from you no but i'll say watching back i watching back me speaking <laughs> what i was writing was like oh mm. uh there were a lot of things that just being on the outside of it in that way um even though you know i'm the one who wrote it but it's I'm excited and I'm nervous about it because it's so personal, but I know that giving it over to someone else to, to, to live in will kind of mine more room for me in uh, the universality and finding more universality in my, in my writing and in my piece. I've sometimes, you know, being in this process has felt very secluded and very, and, you know, we're already in isolation. So it's like isolate and like do this really personal like work of art. Um, so to hear it, it's I'm, all that to say, it's time now to give the baby away, you know, well, not give the baby away, share, share the love, share it, you know, and all in and all in service to learning and deepening more and finding you know finding what's new we're still finding the pieces go yeah. for it, justin <laughs> thank you i'm i'm afraid i'm going to be the bad guy who who, <laughs> who says that we're going to have to wrap up here i'm so so grateful i know there are a lot of questions left and, and we could probably go on for days it, these works are just being born. They're, we're bringing Justin and Frank are coming back. Uh, to, they're not going anywhere. They're going to share more. But we're so grateful to both of you for sharing at this early stage with us. Um, I wanted to, um, Tracy set me up really wonderfully um, and said, is there any way to see the uh, the previous first uh, first looks? And we there are. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, if you go to our website, you can uh, find our YouTube page there. And you can see JJ Johnson and Jasmine Cardenas's uh, sharing of their piece, um, which was just tremendous um, on our YouTube, as well as many conversations um, and, and um, parts of our, our learning programs that have happened over the course of the last year and some just fun performance stuff there too. Um, and then uh, I wanted to make sure you all knew that we have seven more of these uh, artists who are gonna be shared in the, in the coming months. So um, stay, read those e-blasts, sign up on our social media make sure that you're aware because there are so many brilliant artists at work right now and we can't wait to share them i'm going to turn it over to d to, to to wrap up for us all right so alex stole some of my lines uh never let an artistic director upstage you that's what i have always said um so yeah we do have seven more to go four shared seven more to go and our next first look Number three is going to be on June 12th at 2 p.m. So make sure you look for that e-blast and make sure you sign up for that. I also wanted to say if you have more questions that we were not able to get to because of time, you can certainly email them to me. I will get in touch with the artists and send their responses back to you. My email address is Deirdre Starnes at firststage.org. You can find it on our website, firststage.org. D-E-I-D-R-A 
Starnes. Uh, so that's how you can get those questions. Carlos, I really loved your question and I really would love for you to like send that to me so I can get that to him because it, it's a very important question and I think, uh, you know, you should you should get an answer to. I also want to talk to you about some very, oh, JJ is here, by the way, those of you who were part of our first look one. So he is here in the room with us. So yay, JJ, thank you for supporting your squad. Um, something very exciting that is getting ready to happen. We have two of our uh, masters in this uh, conversation, Jane and Nick. We are launching our first series of master classes. Uh, Jane is going to be bold and start us off with her first master class in June as well. Um, and so uh, we are so excited in May, sorry, May, May 15th. Yes, May 12th. Thank you so much, Jane. I read your, I read your mouth. Uh, May 15th, um, she is going to be doing acting a song. We have Nick Olcott that's also in here with us. He is going to be doing a monologue um, a coaching and also auditioning techniques. Uh, we also have Craig Wallace, Kenyatta Rogers, Femby Duncan, Matt Wilson, Jose Carasquillo, Skillo and her, Jose Carasquillo. So these are our masters. They're all spread out on the calendar with different classes. Shakespeare, uh, She Said, She Said, which is one of my favorite, a little deep dive into female uh, uh, play analysis. We have um, Commedia del Art and just, just a lot of different things for you. And I will say at the very low price of $35, for a two hour master class. Femby's is a two part, so hers is 65. Um, but please, please, please check our website and join us for that. We are so happy to have you in this space. We are getting closer and closer to being able to meet with you in some other capacity other than Zoom, uh, you know, uh, uh, President Biden keeps saying, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and there really, really is. I have learned in this time that there is nothing like live theater. I don't care whether people have streamed it. I don't care if it was the Disney version of Hamilton. There is nothing like being in the space with the artists, breathing air with them, taking a journey with them. So we are willing it back into existence. Uh, we are blessed to have Alex at our helm who has guided us through this process. And I wanna thank all of you who have been supporting us through this because it is because of you that we are all here with artists who are working through this pandemic. And thank you so much. We love you. 